became muddled. The next thing Diggory knew was a soft green light coming down on him from above, and darkness below. He didn't seem to be standing on anything, or sitting, or lying. Nothing appeared to be touching him. I believe I'm in water, said Diggory, or under water. This frightened him for a second. Almost at once he could feel that he was rushing upwards. Then his head suddenly came out into the air and he found himself scrambling ashore on the smooth grassy ground at the edge of a pool. As he rose to his feet, he noticed that he was neither dripping nor panting for breath, as anyone would expect after being underwater. His clothes were perfectly dry. He was standing by the edge of a small pool, not more than ten feet from side to side, in a wood. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that he could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was a green light that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead, for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards, as far as his eyes could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood was very much alive. When he just tried to describe it afterwards, Degree always said it was a rich place, as rich as a plum cake. The strangest thing was that almost before he had looked at about him, Degree had half forgotten how he had come here. At any rate, he was certainly not thinking about Polly, or Uncle Andrew, or even his mother. He was not in the least frightened, or excited, or curious. If anyone had asked him, where did you come from? He would have probably said, I've always been here. That was what it felt like, as if one had always been in, this, in that place and never been bored though nothing had ever happened, and he said long afterwards, it's not the sort of place where things happen, the trees go on growing, that's all. After Diggory had looked at the wood for a long time, he noticed there was a girl lying on her back, at the foot of a tree a few yards away. Her eyes were nearly shut, but not quite, as if she was just between sleeping and waking. So he looked at her for a long time and said nothing, and at last she opened her eyes and looked at him for a long time and said nothing. Then she spoke in a dreamy, contented sort of voice. I think I've seen you before, she said. I rather think so too, said Diggory. Have you been here long? Oh, always, said the girl. At least, I don't know. A very long time. So have I, said Diggory. No, you haven't, she said. I've just seen you come up out of the pool. Yes, I suppose I did, said Diggory with puzz a puzzled air. I'd forgotten. Then for quite a long time, neither said any more. Look here, said the girl presently. I wonder, did we ever really meet? I had a sort of idea, a sort of picture in my head, of a boy and girl, like us, living somewhere quite different, and doing all sorts of things. Perhaps it was only a dream. I've had that same dream, I think, said Diggory, about a boy and a girl living next door, and something about crawling among rafters. I remember the girl had a dirty face. Aren't you getting mixed? In my dream, it was a boy who had a dirty face. 
I can't remember the boy's face, said Diggory. And then added, Hello, what's that? Why, it's a guinea pig, said the girl, and it was a fat guinea pig, nosing about in the grass. But round the middle of the guinea pig there ran a tape, and onto it, by the tape, was a bright yellow ring. Look, look, said Diggory, the ring. Finger, and so have I. The girl now sat up, really interested at last. They stared very hard at one another, trying to remember, and then, exactly the same moment, she shouted, Mr. Kettley, and he shouted again, Uncle Andrew, and they knew who they were and began to remember the whole story. After a few minutes, hard talking, they got it straight. Diggory explained how beastly Uncle Andrew had been. What do we do now? said Polly. Take the guinea pig and go home? There's no hurry, said Diggory with a huge yawn. I think there is, said Polly. This place is too quiet. It's so, so dreamy. You're almost asleep. If we were given, if we want give in to it, we shall lie down and drowse for ever and ever. It's very nice here, said Diggory. Yes, it is, said Polly. But we've got to get back. She stood up and began to go cautiously towards the guinea pig, but then she changed her mind. We might as well leave the guinea pig, she said. It's perfectly happy here. At your home, your uncle will only do something horrible, horrid if we take it home. I bet he would, answered Diggory. Look at the way he's treated us. By the way, how do we get home? Go back to the pool, I expect. Then came, they came and stood together at the edge looking down into the smooth water. It was full of the reflection of the green leafy branches. They made it look very deep. We haven't any bathing things, said Polly. We shall need them, silly, said Yuri. We're going in with our clothes on. Don't you remember? It didn't wet us on the way up. Can you swim? A bit. Can you? Well, not very much. I don't think we we shall need to swim, said Diggory. We want to go down, don't we? Neither of them liked the idea very much of jumping into that pool. But neither said so to the other. They took hands and said one, two, three and jumped. There was a great splash, and of course they closed their eyes, but when they opened them again, they found they were still standing, hand in hand, in the green wood, and hardly up to their ankles in water. The pool was apparently only a couple of inches deep. They splashed back onto the dry ground. What on earth gone wrong, said Polly, in a frightened voice, but not so quite so frightened as you might expect, because it's hard to really feel frightened in that place is too peaceful. Oh, I know, said Diggory. Of course it won't work. We're still wearing our yellow rings. The outward journey, you know. The green ones take you home. We must change rings. Have you got pockets? Good. Put your yellow ring in your left. I've got two greens. Here's one for you. They put on the green ring the pool, but before they tried another dump jump, Diggory gave a long, no. Oh. What's the matter, said Polly? I've just had a really wonderful idea, said Diggory. What are all the other pools? How do you mean? Why, if we can get back to our own world by jumping into this pool, might we get somewhere else by jumping into one of the others? Supposing there was a world at the bottom of every pool. I thought we were already in you were already in your Uncle Andrew's other world or other place or whatever he called it. Didn't you say? Oh bother, Uncle Andrew interrupted Diggory. I don't believe he knows anything about it. He never had the pluck to come here himself. And he only talked of one other world. But suppose there were dozens. You mean this wood might be only one of them? No, 
I don't believe this world is a world at all. I think it's just sort of an in-between place. Polly looked puzzled. Don't you see, said the Grey. No, do listen. Think of our tunnel under the slates at home. It isn't really a room in any of the houses. But in a way, it really isn't part of any of the houses. But once you're in the tunnel, you can go along it and come out at the same any of the houses in the room. Why then this would be the same? A place that isn't in any of the worlds. But once you've found that place, you can get in between them all. Well, even if you can, began Polly. But Diggory went on as if he hadn't heard her. And of course that explains everything, he said. That's why it's so quiet and sleepy here. Nothing ever happens here. And like at home. It's in the houses that people talk and do things and have meals. Nothing goes on in the in-between places, between the walls and above the ceilings and under the floor, or in our own tunnel. But when you come out of our tunnel, you may find yourself in any house. I think we can get out of this place into Jollywell anywhere. We don't need to jump back into the same pool we came up by, or not just yet. The wood between the worlds, said Polly, dream Polly dreamily. It sounds rather nice. Come on, said Diggory. Which pool shall we try? Look here, said Polly. I'm not going to try any new pool till we've made sure that we can get back to the old one. We're not even sure if it'll work yet. Yes, said Diggory. And get caught by Uncle Andrew and have our rings taken away before we've had any fun. No thanks. Can't we just go part the way down into our own pool, said Polly, just to see if it works? And if it does, we'll change rings and come up again before we're really back in Mr. Kettley's study. Can we get part of the way down? Well, it took time coming up. I suppose it'll take a little time going back. I think there's a train going past. Sorry. Uh, Diggory made, a, made rather a fuss about agreeing to this. But he had to in the end as Polly absolutely refused to do any exploring in new worlds until she had made sure about getting back into the old one. She was quite as brave as he about some dangers, wasps for instance, but she was not so interested in finding out things nobody had ever heard of before. For Diggory was the sort of person who wants to know everything, and when he grows up, become the famous Professor Kirk who comes out who comes into the other books. After a good deal of arguing they agreed to put on the green rings. Green for safety, said Diggory, so you can't help remembering which is which. And hold hands and jump. But as soon as they seemed to be getting back into but Uncle Landry's study, we've no world, Polly was about to shout Change and they would slip off their greens and put on their yellows. Diggory wanted to be the one who shouted change, but Polly wouldn't agree. They put on the green rings, took hands, and once more shouted, One, two, three, go. This time it worked. It was very hard to tell what it felt like. For everything happened so quickly. At first, there were bright lights moving out about in the black sky. Diggory always thinks these stars, and even swears, he saw Jupiter quite close, close enough to see it in the moon. But almost at once, there were rows and rows of roofs, and chimney pots about them. They could see St. Paul's, then they were looking at London, before you could see through the walls of the houses. Then they could see Uncle Andrew, very vague and shadowy, but getting clearer and more solid looking all the time just as if he was coming into focus. But before he came quite real, Polly shouted, Change! And they did change. And our world faded away like a dream, and the green light above grew stronger and stronger, till their heads came out of the pool, and they scrambled ashore. There was a wood all about them, as green and as bright and still as ever. The whole thing had taken less than a minute, there, said Diggory. That's all right. Now for the adventure. Any pool will do. Come on, let's try that one. Stop, said Polly. Aren't we 
were going to mark this ball. They stared at each other and turned quite white as they realised the dreadful thing that Diggory had just been going to do. For there were any number of pools in the wood. And the pools were all alike, and the trees were all alike. So it had left one pool behind and led to our world. To our own world without making some sort of landmark. The chances would have been a hundred to one against them ever finding it again. Diggory's hand was shaking as he opened his penknife and cut out a long strip of turf on the bank of the wood pool. The soil, which smelled nice, was of a rich reddish brown and showed up well against the green. It's a good thing one of us has some scent, said Polly. Well, don't keep on guessing about it, said Diggory. Come along. I want to see what's in the other pools. And Polly gave him a pretty sharp answer, and he said something even nastier in reply. The quarrel lasted for several minutes, but it would be dull to write it all down, so let's just skip on to that moment which stood with beating hearts and a rather scared faces at the edge of an unknown pool with the yellow rings on, and held their hands and once more said, One, two, three, go. Splash. Once again, it hadn't worked. This pool, too, appeared to be only a puddle. Instead of reaching a new world, they got their feet wet and splashed the legs for the second time that morning. If it was a morning, it seems to always be the same time in the wood between the worlds. Blast and botheration, explained Diggory. Well, what's gone wrong now? We put on our yellow rings of right. He said yellow for the outward journey. Now, the truth was that Uncle Andrew, who knew nothing about the wood between the worlds, hadn't quite... Uh, had quite a wrong idea about the rings. The yellow ones weren't outward rings, and the greens weren't homeward rings, at least, not in the way he thought. The stuff which worked both were made all had all come from the wood. The stuff in yellow rings had the power to draw you into the wood. It was the stuff that wanted to get back to its own place, the in-between place. The stuff in the green rings is the stuff that is trying to get out of its own place. So the green ring would take you out of the wood, into a world. Uncle Andrew, you see, was working with things he did not really understand. Most magicians are. Of course, Diggory did not realise the truth quite clearly either. But not till later, when they talked it over, they decided to try the green rings in the new pool, just to see what happened. I'm game if you are, said Polly. But she realised she really said this because in her heart of hearts she now felt that neither kind of ring was going to work at all in the new pool. And so there's nothing worse to be afraid of than the splash. I'm not quite sure that Diggory had the same feeling. At any rate, when they had put their ring the greens on and got back to the edge of the water, taken hands, there were certainly a good deal more cheerful and less solemn than it had been the first time. One, two, three, go, said Diggory, and they jumped.